All right, we're back uh, live here. We've been watching the cross exam. In I was saying in studio that this is the sort of trial where you don't even have to have been following the case that closely to watch the cross examination and to say, "Wow." This is really interesting and compelling and confusing in its own weird way because we're trying to figure out exactly uh, what her defense is. Um, I'm joined again in studio by Heather Hansen and the, the attorney um, and by Rachel Stockman, who's the editor-in-chief of LawNews.com. All right, so Heather, uh, how's she holding up? Terrible. It's terrible. I mean, you know, I've never seen anything like it. It's she just consistently admits to having lied over and over and over again. And then, and the prosecutor is doing a very good job of laying out, and you lied here, and you lied here, and you lied here, and you lied here, and yet you're telling the truth to these 14 strangers. That's very effective. It's getting a little repetitive, but it's very effective. Well, and I think that's essentially her defense. Don't believe what I told police. I'm telling you the truth here. But what struck me, too, uh, during the testimony was her, and, and this is something the prosecutor brought out in the questioning, is her lack of emotion. Mm -hmm. So she's describing, uh, you know, her husband shooting this guy and then dismembering this guy who apparently she said she was in love with, yet she's not really flinching on the yeah. stand. I, I mean, she's... At one point when the prosecutor pointed it out, she started tearing up mm -hmm, a little bit, yeah. but there's absolutely no emotion there when she's going through this. Like, uh, is, she, is she on some kind of medication, and, 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 or is this how she is normally? And, and she's admitting that she <laughs> lied repeatedly to the to the detectives, as she has to, and yet there doesn't seem to be any real sense of, like, you know, oh, I know this is terrible that I lied. <laughs> right. I um, mean, you know, I feel awful about it. It's it's this sort of like, yo, yo, no, that was a lie. Right. right. Uh, that, <laughs> that was true. That was a lie. That was a lie, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, so, I mean, right? and it's not just to investigators. It's to her family. One of the things that the, they keep talking about is this goodbye letter that she wrote to her parents, who she apparently loved and had a relatively close relationship with. So it's not as if it's just one set of lies. It's multiple set of lies, which makes the prosecutor's job hard because they have to choose which piece of evidence to show the contradictions in. But, I mean, she's got lies. That's one thing she is not lacking in, is lies. And, and she's saying that this was all due to the fact that she was suicidal and on drugs, and this caused her uh, to perpetuate these lies. But again, how is the jury, when they're watching this, going to figure out when she's telling the truth and when she's not? And I, I'm not convinced, based on you know how much she knows about what happens and what she admitted to in terms of choosing where to put the the weapon, the murder weapon, mm -hmm. that she wasn't involved in this. Well, and even more than choosing, having the influence over her husband to get him to do what she said. I think that that's something the prosecutor did well, because you've got to remember, her claim is, I was under duress. I was afraid of him. He was out of control. And yet she could influence him as to where to put the murder weapon and what to do with the body and what to do next. I think that those two stories just don't mesh up very well for well, wait, her. She, wait, remember, it was just a suggestion. Yeah, she, I, she didn't <laughs> say that the murder <laughs> weapon had to go where they <laughs> dumped it. Was, I just was making a suggestion. And he took my suggestion. Right, because she has this background in forensics. Right, it was exactly. her minor in college. And, and her major was psychology. And you see that there as well, that the, the prosecutor is saying to her, you know, well, with your psychology major, trying to sort of play on her intelligence or yeah. her feeling that she's smarter than anyone in the room. And yeah, and you can also see that she tries to kind of outsmart, or she thinks she's trying to outsmart the prosecutor. Well, ex repeat that question one right. more time. Right. You mean Exhibit 35? Yes, yeah. and she knows all oh, the she exhibit knows. numbers. Yes. Quick programming note, uh, you're watching the Law News Network, uh, the brand new network that launched today that is going to be covering trials and it's going to be uh, your place, I hope, uh, to come to to watch all of the biggest trials. We've got a number of big stories today. This Cochran trial where she's on the stand, the Stand Your Ground hearing of Curtis Reeves, the guy who uh, shot someone in a movie theater, overthrown popcorn. There the question is, is he going to have to stand trial at all? And then this unbelievable trial of attempted murder, kidnapping, sexual assault of an MMA fighter named War Machine who apparently part of his defense is, well, my ex was a porn star and she had rape fantasies. Yeah, that's actually part of the defense. So we're covering a, a lot of fascinating stories, but someone who's been really following the Kelly Marie Cochran case very closely um, is Kathy Russin, who is the, uh, the founder of a terrific website called Court Chatter. And uh, she joins us now. Kathy, thanks for taking the time. 
Hello, Dan. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. So, you've been watching the uh, the Cochrane trial. I don't think there's anyone in the nation probably following this case, apart from the lawyers, as closely as you have. Um, we saw on Friday her testimony on direct examination seemed pretty good, seemed decent. Hey, wait a sec. Maybe it was the right call. Now she's on the stand on cross-examination. How do you think she's doing? Well, I don't agree that it went so great on Friday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Right. She's, very, she's very flat affect, no emotion, and uh, we're, <clears throat> we're seeing that today. Cross-examination is a nightmare for the defense. A great prosecutor, and it's just she's just methodically breaking down everything from Friday on direct. And everything today is, the, I love the classic, the classic question, are you lying now or were you lying then? And that is how this prosecutor is breaking down everything that Kelly Cochran has ever said. The great thing about this case that you almost never see is the detective in this case had 40 different conversations with Kelly Cochran. Hmm. And so she was switched her story multiple times. And that's what this prosecutor gets to work with, and that's what we're seeing now on cross-examination. And, and, and Heather, that's a symptom of someone who likes to talk, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Absolutely. She likes to talk a little bit too much. And to Kathy's point, the prosecutor is doing a great job, because now you've got 40 different stories that you've got to try to simplify for the jury to show where the contradictions are without getting caught up in the weeds. And I think she's done a great job with that. I agree with Kathy. But one, one, one legal point here is that, you know, Look, I, I think her story on the whole is coming across as not that credible. I think we all agree on that. But when you're talking about proving something beyond a reasonable doubt, and that's the legal standard, it's not just do I believe her or don't I. It's do I really not believe her so much that I am convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that it couldn't be the way that she's saying it happened. And, and Rachel, I think that's kind of the best hope here mm -hmm. for the defense is relying on that legal standard. Exactly. And I mean, I think it's very clear that her husband, Jason, was the one that pulled the trigger. Uh, so now the jurors just have to decide in their mind what role she played in this. Was she, did, you know, was it a panic thing where she's just helping him along the way? Was it premeditated like the prosecutor mm -hmm. said, like they had some kind of pack where they actually lured this guy over? Um, or, you know, uh, was she trying to cover up for her husband or is it what she said and that she was fearful of her husband because she had endured years and years of abuse uh, and she felt like she had to do this so it's interesting what I, I don't know if I've made up my mind in terms of what role she specifically plays I think there's enough confusion there that certainly you know there's going to be some questions for some of the charges in terms of how the jurors because, interpret and, and this. Heather as you answer that question also take us through hmm. what the charges are Oh my gosh, there's a, there's a wide array of charges. Most of them have to do... Now, when it comes to the homicide charge, the defense of duress, which is really what her defense is uh, as a whole, doesn't apply. So you can't... Uh, the judge has already ruled on that in, before the trial started. But we're talking about all kinds of accessory Conspir after the crime. Conspiracy um, to commit... Uh, what is it? Charges of conspiracy to commit dead body, dead body, body dismemberment, dismemberment and mutilation, concealing the death of an individual, accessory after the fact, lying to a peace officer, and of course the homicide open murder charge. Right, and so this is why jury charge is going to be so important, Dan, because to your point, they've got to prove each of these beyond a reasonable doubt to each of the jurors. So one juror says, eh, you know, I don't know about whether or not she had the intent to commit homicide. They, you know, the prosecution has not met their burden. Kathy, I'm going to ask you the ultimate question, which is, do you think that the defense regrets calling her to the witness stand? Um, well, <laughs> We rarely see a defendant on the witness stand for a reason, and I think she's a horrible witness. I think they had to call her. Um, I don't think, I disagree with Rachel. I don't think this is a hard call at all for the jury. I, her parents were the worst witnesses for her. Her very own parents showed that uh, Kelly's in charge. Kelly was in charge in that relationship, and there is no way that she was afraid of her husband. So you're not, uh, Kathy, so you're not buying into her defense that she suffered years and years of abuse? Not a chance. Why is that? Because she's, it's never been mentioned, and I get with domestic violence that that is usually silent, 
She never mentioned it. The prosecutor brought that up today, that the first time she ever mentioned Jason was abusive was when these charges came about. Her Both of her parents talked about, um, they, she grew up next door to Jason, so the parents have known Jason the, his whole entire life, talked about what a great guy he was, and, what a, um, and they've known the two of them as a couple their whole lives, talked about how Kelly was in charge and wore the pants in that family, and that um, that's not how Jason was. Kat, Kathy. And she had multiple affairs. Kathy, what did you think about the testimony? I think the first witness the defense called was the neighbor who had seen her mowing the lawn with Jason sort of pacing back and forth in tandem with Kelly as she mowed the lawn. Did that have any impact on you? Well, I think that is because now at this point, Kelly's had multiple affairs. And uh, he is, he's now in a mode of non-trust, and this is toward the end, because he'd been looking at his cell phone a lot. So now maybe we're in just a little bit of a different point in their relationship. But look, she's not afraid of him. She's, she's openly, almost openly cheating on him. That's not really an abused woman right. who's afraid of her husband. I really don't think that these 12 people are stupid, and I don't think this is going to be a hard call on those charges. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you that jurors, you know, we, we trust jurors and jurors get it. And they're sitting in the room and seeing the, the body language even better than we are, you know, and, and sort of feeding off of one another's energy. So, you know, I think that you're, unless some sort of uh, star witness expert, <laughs> medical experts coming up, I think that uh, this prosecutor is doing a darn good job in putting this case together. Great. Now, what is, uh, do you have any sense of who will be next? I don't. No. As far as I know, they may be ending with her. Yeah, I, I, we were talking about that during, during um, some of the testimony as to whether or not the prosecutor would, I mean, the defense rather, would call some sort of an expert to maybe address the fact, as you brought up, of this really blunt affect where she doesn't smile and she doesn't cry, and to give some explanation for that. Because I can't imagine that any jury, just as we watching, have any sympathy for this woman based in large part on the fact that she just doesn't respond. So I'm wondering if that might be their uh, last hope, is to call some sort of expert expert to address this. That's a good point because one of the things she said to Detective Ogden in these 40 different uh, times he spoke with her, the very one of the very last things she said she wanted to speak to him in, uh, from the jail was um, she wanted to talk to him about love and she said, I've never been able to feel the emotion of love and I want to know, uh, I think that you can feel that and I want to know <laughs> how that feels, something to that effect. So uh, I, that could be, and we do see that in a lot of cases right. where they don't end with the defendant, if the defendant testifies, they do end with some expert to explain what is wrong with this person. Right. Um, so that could happen. Yeah. And uh, Kathy, so thank you so much for joining us from Court Chatter. Uh, Kathy's been watching this case really closely along with her followers who we welcome here to the Law News Network. If you're just joining us, uh, this is our first day we have launched our network. We've been providing live streams from a variety of very exciting uh, court events that are going on, including the Kelly Marie Cochran trial where we had the defendant in the case, which is quite rare, take the stand. So we were just talking about some of what happened because, again, she is facing some brutal charges. I wanted to go through a little bit of what we heard this morning, play back to, to you some of the sound uh, of what we heard, uh, especially, and Heather, you pointed this out, was when uh, the prosecutor was talking about uh, her lies and uh, she brought up a, a different crime scene. Let, let's take a listen to that. Mm. Spot for where the car should be parked. I suggest that it is. And your training and, friend, and experience in forensics told you it would be a bad idea to put the car in your crime scene, right? I wanted it to be found. Wouldn't you agree it's a bad idea to put the car in your crime scene? A bad idea to do what? To put the car near the crime scene? I have no clue. No, your training and experience in forensics doesn't tell you it's a bad idea to put a car in a crime scene? Where do you consider the crime scene? Your house. I put Are you telling us there's another crime scene? No. Because I'd, I'd be interested in hearing that if there is. No. So did you tell Chief Rizzo that you took Chris's car keys and put them into a soda cup from the gas station and threw it into the trash? I did tell her that. 
So, accurate or wrong? That was a lie. Why would you lie about that? Because I lied about a lot of things. Why lie about something else? Is it insignificant as putting the keys in a soda can or in the trash? Why lie about any of that? Well, that's what we want to know from you today. So why I, don't you tell us? I wanted to be made to be seen as uh, this horrible person, this monster, because I felt guilty that Chris was. Now, Heather, what did you make of that when uh, Cochran basically on the stand talked about this other crime scene and the prosecutor basically questioned, wait, is this something we, we should well, know about? Well, the thing <laughs> is, I think that the prosecutor knows that there's some question as to whether or not Kelly is actually involved in other murders that has been out there. And so when the, she referenced another crime scene, and I think, I think to be fair, um, she was just sort of trying to clarify the question. But when she brought up another crime scene, the prosecutor's ears certainly went up a little bit, and she certainly said, well, do you know of some other crime scene. I think the other thing that the prosecutor keeps doing, and I'd like to get Kathy's opinion on this too, is trying to bait her about her forensic, she mitered in forensics in college, and to keep saying, well, all your forensic training, didn't you know not to leave the car at the crime scene? I think that that's definitely an attempt at baiting, and we've seen that. To some, try to get her to admit she had a larger role in this. And also just to get her mad. You know, yeah. just to get her thinking, like, you know, if you're so smart, why, did, and you did all this studying on this stuff mm -hmm. at school, why didn't you do a better job in hiding the body? And I think she's trying to bait her a little bit into, into showing some um, angry emotion. Kathy, do you agree? Do you think it's working? Well, Kelly, as many other defendants, thinks she's the smartest person yes. in that room. <laughs> and uh, she talked about taking a forensics course and now backpedals and, and says things like, well, we didn't really talk about the part about cleaning up blood at the scene. And the prosecutor says, uh, you talked about reading this entire book, the entire book. Well, I don't think we read the, chap the chapters on cleaning up blood at a scene. And the whole thing is like this backpedal, go forward, backpedal, go forward. And she, and she smirks. So Kelly, I talk about her having a flat affect, and the whole time she's like this. She's kicked back, almost like this on the stand, and having no emotion, none. But then, all of a sudden, she'll have a little smirk and a little smile go up at the prosecutor. None of that is working in her favor for that jury. Trust me on that. Yeah. And none, no emotion. Remember how much she loves Chris Regan? Remember how much she cares for him and the feelings she has? Uh, yeah, none of that's coming through when she's talking about uh, the cutting up of his body and murdering him. Right, and there was a specific interaction where the state asks her about the lack of emotion. Uh, and she said, the state asked, the prosecutor asked, was it horrifying watching your husband kill Chris? Uh, and she responds, Watching him up was har watching him get cut up was horrifying. As if you know this actual the actual shooting, yeah. which she said she didn't see, uh, was not horrifying. But okay, once we started getting to the point where where her husband Chopping was dismembering body. Yeah. a body, yeah. that's when all of a sudden. Uh, she felt emotion about it. And then she also talked about these things are easier to do than to say, which was which was some, uh, an area where the prosecutor played some cat, cat and mouse with her. But, you know, she definitely, um, there's something mentally going on. I mean, I don't know that it's anything that ha it gives us any excuse whatsoever for this. But there's, I, I, if, the, if the defense doesn't call someone to explain this lack of affect, this lack of remorse, lack of emotion, I think that they've left a big part of this puzzle un, unmet. Well, that's going to be the one thing. So this is what we know about juries. This is at least what I know about juries in all of these cases I've covered, is they will look for a mental problem. They'll look for a mental health problem, at least enough to want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And she is showing no emotion at all about this. And um, there might be, I don't know the backgrounds of these jurors, there might be someone in their family with a mental health problem, something like that. We all know that they bring their personal lives into that jury room. Um, so that could be the only thing working in Kelly's favor is that she is a whack job up there on, <laughs> on that stand. And that could give them some pause maybe in some of those I, charges. I, I don't know, Kathy, if I totally agree with you because perhaps it could even show that she is this cold-blooded uh, serial killer that the prosecution is making her out to be potentially. Um, but we do know that jurors um, do tend to have a little, little more sympathy for females right. than males. Right. 
Yeah, and, and if and you know if any one of the jurors buys this battered woman thing, and I think Kathy, your points about the fact that this is a, a, a totally new allegation with very little evidence about it. But if one juror buys that, and then there's someone to sort of put into place this idea of a mental health problem, it may be enough. And I, and I don't think. I mean, you know, Dan talked about the number of charges against her. I don't think Kelly walks. With a with free from any conviction on any of these charges, I think the attempt here is to just mitigate as much as she possibly can, and in the hopes that maybe it will be less time for her. Absolutely, and I think that is at this point uh, because she had such a brutal day uh, on the stand that perhaps that is her only hope in in, in terms of when it gets to the jurors. Kathy, if you're her lawyer, what are you what are you thinking about for redirect? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think I think you uh, you have to go back to the abuse. Yep. And how that felt, and um, being scared, yep. and how much you did feel for Chris Regan. And you're going to have to end with the abuse. That's yeah. really all they have. Yeah, I think you're right. And again, you know, it is plausible, like you've been saying, that they bring on an expert witness who talks about how a lot of times that women who undergo this kind of abuse that she claims mm -hmm. to have undergone, um, you know, don't report it right away and don't call the cops right away. And so, don't talk about it, right? And don't talk about it. Again, uh, I think the leap between all between that and all of the lies she told detectives uh, I think that's going to be a hard bridge for the defense to overcome but it's possible yeah there's gonna have to be some sort of claim of dissociation that she was just not even with it but didn't she volunteer at a domestic violence um, she place did. so that could also again an expert could potentially say that that was a way of her talking about it with others without having to actually tell her own story so I mean maybe that will play into um, the defense the, the interesting thing is going to be what happens after she's done testifying. I think that, you know, the one thing that I, I think, and uh, Kathy, I'd like to get your opinion on this as well. Browse. Uh, it is a uh, state of Nevada versus war machine. Uh, and, and again, this is his legal yep. name. He was a professional fighter. And in 2008, he changed his name to war machine. He's facing all sorts of charges. 32 felony counts, uh, including sexual assault, uh, rape, attempted murder. Uh, so we are on standby and we have a reporter uh, who's going to be joining us shortly from Las Vegas who's going to kind of walk us through that case just a bit. But 